can go through it. I'll be looking at how many we have. While we allow more people to join, just give me two minutes just to join the Facebook to see how we're doing on the Facebook. All right, I think the other numbers are struggling to join in. I know it's supposed to be full, so maybe this is the time that we can carry on. Um, I want to welcome everyone that is joining us via Zoom. We're nearly 300 in the Zoom, and I see the numbers growing steadily on the other channels. So I just want to welcome you. My name is Casey Makubele to this uh, dental clinical uh, protocol development team. It's a feedback session, um, which is going to be led by the coordinator of this uh, work stream, which is Dr. Uh, Blakey Swart. How it's going to work is he will make a presentation after Prof. Moipelai has spoken, welcoming you in a few words. You will then, he will carry on. What I'm asking everyone is to ensure that your questions are typed in the Q&A session if you are in the Zoom. And I can see already there's a one comment or question there um, as we go along. At the end of his presentation, I will uh, read all of the questions and the panel will answer the questions in the best way they know how. If you are on our Facebook, please um, type your questions there and um, they will send those to me and we will also read those uh, from, from Facebook. Uh, thank you so much to everyone. I think it is time that we can now carry on. I would like to ask Prof Moy Pillai, who is the president of the South African Dental Association, to say a few words. Thank you. Prof? Thank you, Casey, and wel <clears throat> welcome to all the participants for making time this evening to get more um, information regarding the dental clinical protocols. And um, huge thanks to the dental clinical protocols team for doing this huge amount of work that they, they have embarked on to continue to um, keep us informed on how in the time of COVID, we need to be doing dentistry. I think what this pandemic has um, highlighted is that we need to do dentistry in a different manner and um, focus more on um, infection control as we know that we are a high risk um, aerosol generating profession. So without further ado, I want to thank the CEO and his team at headquarters, head office, and also uh, Ms. Norma and the IT team for um, ensuring that the webinars go, go, go on seamlessly. And this is, I, I guess this is a way to, to show us that dentistry has to do the, has to go the, the dig, digital route going forward. And without any more words, I just want to say thank you. And let's hope that we get much more out of uh, tonight's webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, we have at this stage um, 105 that have joined us through the live Facebook link. So we will carry on and we currently on our Zoom 300. Because of the importance of today's meeting, I do not want to waste time. I want to immediately go to or hand over to Dr. Swart, who will do have his presentation. Thank you, Dr. Swart. Thank you very much, uh, Casey, for the introduction. And uh, as you know, we were the clinical dental protocol development team. And uh, our aim was to look at the, the core group, was to look at what the small little virus SARS-CoV-2 
and how that has changed our lives. And uh, we looked at it in 2020. And with that, we also found that we were, night, we were, were uniting oral health care in South Africa in a big way. And the last time where we spent, where we uh, ended our list, uh, lecture, it was to say, we are holding hands and we're going forward. And we are there to serve you, the oral health care workers of South Africa. And we have had some tremendous response from you, tremendous help. And please do not stop because we have finished our document that normally takes in excess of 18 months in 11 days. Um, a very good support from the core group, but we would like the final finishes to come from you. And then we were at the road where, because of this little virus, we could be proactive in doing something before it reached us because we were a little behind the rest of the world, or we could be reactive. And luckily, because of SADA, we went the proactive way. And if you looked, I will just want to give you a little insight of what had went on behind the scenes, because the core group didn't know each other well. And it's like, how do you solve a puzzle? Now, I like a puzzle to put everything down in front of me, and then I'll start sorting. And as the groups get smaller, I take out what I really want. Um, and that's the way I solve a problem. But I realized it's not how the other people solve problems. Because if you look at Piet, he is very meticulous. So he'll build the frame and then he'll meticulously put one piece to fit into the other. On the other hand, Howard Gluckman would take hours putting the string together and deciding this is not exactly how he wants it. Then he would scramble it up again and put it down again until it fitted the puzzle perfectly. And so each, each one of the core group had their own way of getting it together. And that is how we solved the puzzle. Because we realized that we had to do a digital teamwork because it was not possible for us to get together anymore. We were looking at the stars and in the star was a little virus, a little green virus that we saw. And if you looked at that little virus, it was a physical problem. And remember, it's potential of physical damage to ourselves, to our patients and to the population at large. If you're exposed to a few uh, viruses, you will get a cold. Maybe you'll get a sore throat. But if you are constantly uh, subjected to high viral load, any normal body cannot fight that. And it could lead to serious or even fatal problems. And here I'm especially referring to the N95 mask. And unfortunately, how cost effective, however we want it to be, that's one thing we could never solve. Because if you are going to get too high a viral load, you could kill yourself. We were looking after you. And then financially, we also needed to get back to work. And I can tell you that in the time of lockdown, I did not receive one single cent yet my overheads went ahead. So I am in very much the same boat as what all of you are. And the complaints you have, I have as well, but that is not the way to get to the result. So what did we do? The, uh, we were the core group started in the beginning. And then we looked at how the AO, EAO with the help of international group, how they, looked at the COVID virus. We also went further and I contacted Egon Juve. You that do not know Egon, he's a very prominent implantologist and he had a very interesting story to tell. The week before COVID, his oral hygienist saw a couple of patients. Three of them tested positive for the COVID. She then contracted COVID was admitted to hospital at ICU 
And at 39, she's now recovering, most probably with permanent uh, lung damage. Of the three patients that she treated, two has died. He said, Blackie, you're doing you and your group, because definitely it wasn't me. It's our, it was the group. Um, you are doing a very important thing. And two of those people, two of those patients died. So he was hiding in Namibia and stressing the importance of this document. I also contacted Dr. Gerry Uri, who runs a very big practice in Belgium. Because I think if you looked at the curves of Belgium and Italy, and you looked at the rest of the world, we knew what was coming. And from that, each of us used our groups, our friends, and our families in the business, in all the different ways, spreading it out. In the end, we had uh, super specialized groups uh, of all the subspecialities in dentistry, special interest groups, social media groups, the academics and individuals all contributing. And it was on a Saturday night that I sent out a call asking for input by the Sunday at five. And there was not one individual that I spoke to. As you can remember, my voice wasn't very good when I spoke last time because none of the people that I spoke to, although they had many questions, none of them uh, did not answer our call. We got the answer back from everybody. So the, what is the oral health implications? Now, in, this is, was distributed as an urgent uh, message, uh, publication, and it came out. And what it dealt with is how we felt as oral healthcare workers and how it affected us. Remembering that we work at a high standard of clinical, uh, um, uh, uh, clinical work with high sterility. In the oral health care facility, the first things that came to mind was that there was a national lockdown and it was well defined, but how did it affect us? South African, the SADA defined the levels in relations to the appropriate national levels, those that you just saw, but they might now differ by region and time. So there must be a way to get the message across so that there is not total anarchy. These measurements are expected to be applicable for an extended time. And if herd immunization, a vaccination or cure is not readily available, it might be there for 18 to 36 months. And that is November, 2023, before total normality can be, re uh, can be reached with herd immunity. Complacency must be guarded against during the easing measures, as this does not indicate lesser risk. The 80-20 principle is very important. These guidelines only give 80% direction. The other 20% would always be you, the professional, making the decision. You have earned your right to be a professional and to be looked up at the community. So your professional opinion is very important. The purpose and the guidelines is very clear. Oral health care has been identified as one of the occupations at the highest risk of contracting the virus and or becoming a node of transmission. The purpose of this clinical document is to guide the oral health care workers in South Africa by providing the clinical of and gui uh, decontamination guidelines for daily procedures in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The goal is to help reduce the opportunity of uncontrolled virus spread. And the guidelines have been created with this sole purpose in mind. Patients having different levels of re uh, dental requirements one cannot, and it is unrealistic, and to expect that all of these patients 
will need the same level of dental care during the COVID-19 pandemic. Pre-procedural patient factors, and that is very well set out in the document. The front office must know as well as you what knowledge they need to, to gain from the patients to allow them in. But there is, they must also know that no cure exists for COVID-19 at this stage. So we need to prevent the spread. Patients' temperatures should be known before entering and no patients with any of the screening answers in the positive should be allowed inside the premises. The principal dental healthcare worker must assume responsibility and the ultimate outcomes of these measures. This cannot be passed on to anybody else. He is responsible. And in my case, I am responsible. What is the emergency cases? You must know your uh, COVID-19 hotline out of your head. It must preferably be posted up somewhere in your practice. It's somebody with persistent pain, a pressure in the chest, uncharacteristic confusion, a bluish face, lips, and inability to be aroused. These patients need urgent and immediate attention, not by you, but by the medical specialists treating this. The practice management, the practice must be set out in such a way that certain areas where aerosols are going to be formed is red and the staff must, some of the front staff must be restricted to these areas. Everybody must know where it's relatively safe and where it is dangerous in your practice. If you have a one-roomed practice, that whole room is red, unfortunately. All areas must be sanitized, not only the clinical area. So a wider spread of sanitization is essential. You must have a practice management plan and policing each other is essential. I found that in this week that we were constantly helping each other and that helped the patients and the uh, community at large. Room ventilation, that is my uh, key topic. Uh, aerosol generation procedures pose a, a big risk. The air of the practice can easily be virus laden without our knowledge. No test exists to show how many viruses you have in the practice. Knowledge is key, especially your neighbors. Fresh air or filtered air can either be natural or artificial, open or closed. The units can be connected or unconnected to fresh air or to the outside of the building. In the loose standing units, it must be remembered that any filtering must be done by hyperhepa, which is equivalent to H13 or 14 filters used in hospitals. They should filter out 0 0.003 microns. The normal HEPA filters that is now often being offered only has a capacity to catch 0.3 microns. So two uh, <coughs> uh, uh, SARS viruses could march by, arm by by, arm, arm in arm through one of those filters. SARS-CoV-2 is only 0.15 micron in size. The normal sterilization and disinfection protocol is, it cannot be overstressed and it I think everybody is well aware of it and you should have a temperature meeting gun at your front office before you allow anybody in. In the rest of your documents, carefully go through our protocol document, but isn't it time to get uh, rid of all the paper trails that we have and rather go over to a computer based, which can be protected with plastic covers and a lot less 
places for the virus to adhere to. So the standard precautions is hand hygiene, the use of appropriate PPEs, respiratory hygiene, cough etiquette, shops must be safely handled, safe injecting practices, such as a septic te technique for parenteral medications, sterile instruments and devices used at all times, clean and disinfect the environmental surfaces as much as possible as you have prepared it beforehand. Leave no, nothing standing, leave the uh, toys for the kids. The, I've even removed all of the paintings in my office because all the surface, surfaces in the practice must be easily clean. With the PPEs, it is very important that the implementation and the use of appropriate PPE has been highlighted by this crisis we are in. Untested or non-scientific evidence could be harmful or detrimental to you because of you have a false sense of security from when wearing these inappropriate of standard equipment. There is a lack of a compliance among dental care providers as seen by previous studies. They will have no impact if they are not used correctly. So the PPEs recommended must be used and worn correctly to be effective. The sequence of putting them on, don or donning, or removing them by doff or doffing is essential. Extended and reuse only apply in emergencies and when there's a sore shortage. Both of those problems we are facing at this stage. Everything that we use can be uh, reused in some or another way, except the N95 or equivalent masks. If we use aerosols, that is a once-off document, uh, equipment that must not be reused in any, in any way. N95 or equivalent in AGPs is uh, non-negotiable. Restrictions are put in place that limit the number of times in which proce uh, procedures reuse of PPEs is allowed. Hand hygiene and PPE use cannot be seen or practiced in isolation in terms of safety and both are equally important. Non-aerosol generation. We will show you what PPEs should be used and pre-operative mouth rinses with 1% hydro hydrogen peroxide or with a 1% povidone iodine cannot be overstressed. As you will see in the document that you will see come upon the sentence more than once. Aerosol generating procedures, these are the difficult ones. Fine aerosol generated by AGP produce fine aerosols, less than five microns uh, or less in diameter that can be suspended in air. Spatter droplets are much larger than aerosols. They're about 50 microns. Both aerosol particles and spatter droplets can contain infectious agents, such as bacteria or viruses. Ultrasonic and sonic transmission during non-surgical procedures have the highest incidence of particle transmissions, followed by air polishing, air and water syringe, and high-speed handpiece hand aerosol, aerosolization. So, we found the person with a, a ultrasonic scaler in, the, in his hand is most probably the most dangerous and at highest risk. Greater safety measures are needed when these devices are used. Rubber dam, HVE, PPE, and post-operative sanitation cannot be overstressed. It is of utmost importance to consider all methods that can minimize the risk of transmission of potentially infection agents such as SARS-CoV-2 to dentists, 
dental auxiliary staff, dental assistants, and patients. Looking at PPEs, what we've done is we've looked at the essential minimal standards that can and should can be used. Um, and that is for aerosol and non-aerosol procedures. But we also looked at the aspirational standards and these graphs are very graphical and very easy to understand. We find that the reasonable dentist would use something in between. The use of dental auxiliaries, I think the time of two-handed surgery is gone. But if you do use it, be very careful, especially with your HVE. Four-handed dentistry is ideal. It reduces the aerosol production and it improves the turnaround time and it improves the overall efficacy and the risk during COVID-9. Ensure all auxiliary staff are trained in all aspects of cross-infection control and aerosol reduction methods. Isolation and suction, rubber dam. I think you've heard it so much from Piet and I am just repeating some of his words because water coolant from a high speed hand can generate aerosols as you know. And I will not go through all of this except that Piet said and stated very well that the oral healthcare patients and objects are at risk of exposure to airborne contamination 2.5 to three times greater than normal. Rubber dam isolation during AGP resulted in 98.8% bacterial reduction. It's a barrier against pathogens from all respiratory secretions. If the rubber dam must, but the rubber dam must be correctly placed as shown here. The reduction of microorganisms by 90% and in a three foot radius from the point of work, a reduction of 70%. Higher aerosol levels on the dentist's head is the only negative. So use a head cover when you use rubber dam. With these damning facts in front of you, the person that does not use rubber dam anymore must rather look at another occupation, especially during COVID-19. High volume suction is extremely important during AGPs the use of HVE at the source is mandatory. At the source, as this picture shows, extra oral evacuation systems can further assist in reducing the aerosol, not eliminating it, but assist in reducing it. It must run at 300 liters per minute of the HVA to assure maximal removal of the aerosol or spatter. Control the potential toxic waste and the meticulous maintenance of HVEs is essential. Recommendations for specialized equipment, as with loops and uh, 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 microscopes, use the manufacturer's guidelines because there isn't much written in the literature about this. Dental loops, ethyl, uh, alcohol can be used as a solution of choice to disinfect the loop telescope and the frame surfaces. The lenses must be cleaned with alcohol or quaternary ammonium disinfectant. The operating microscope can be wiped clean with a damp cloth. Do not use any aggressive or abrasive cleaning agents. Remove any residue using a mixture of 50% alcohol and 50% distilled water plus a dash of household dishwashing liquid. The dishwashing liquid, I suppose, is not determined. For this infection of uh, mechanical surfaces, the maximum concentration are either 60% alcohol or 2% glutaraldehyde or 0.2% quaternary components, uh, compounds. For regular cleaning of the surgical microscope objective lenses and eyepieces, the manufacturers produce cleaning kits should be used. 
sterilize caps for hand grips and knobs and customize sterile drapes to cover the microscope head and the body to protect the microscope from aerosol spray during procedures are available. Are available. Disinfected plastic bags can also be used to protect the microscope from aerosols and should be replaced after each patient. Others in lasers must remember that using a laser is as good as using AGPs as the plume that is formed during a laser is or does contain virus. Both wet and dry lasers produce plume, which has been shown to contain viral material. Plume should be treated in a similar way as aerosols. The photobiomodulation laser does nothing, so it can actually be used in all uh, levels of uh, the COVID-19 uh, levels. Ensure the correct sterilization protocols are used for all the laser parts. And disinfection of the dental impressions in the laboratory work is essential. So the dental impressions invariably are contaminated with patient saliva or blood and are considered potentially infectious. It is responsibility of the dentist to disinfect impressions that are sent to the dental laboratories to prevent cross contamination and spread of the disease. We refer you to the document, the full document on more detail on what is necessary and how each impression material should be treated. So ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, my take home message is in ventilation, be sure that you know what is above you? What does it look like underneath? And what does the vents look like? Rubber dam, we do not need to talk anymore about for restorative, for endo, and for general work. If you want to avoid getting in touch with saliva, a rubber dam is the way to go. HVE used correctly can reduce the aerosol load by a big and significant amount. PPEs is essential, and you should refer to these diagrams that is published in our document to know which PPEs you should be used. The COVID-19 will be with us for some time to go. Complacency is a potential risk, and we should remain vigilant in our approach. Level four lockdown might create the perception that the worst is over and we can let our guard down, but it is not. As a result, we have a responsibility and accountability towards patients, students, the publics and the colleagues. Oral healthcare professionals collectively, collective behavior will contribute to a culture of resilience characterized by altruism, pragmatism, and the management of, of anxiety. You, the oral health care worker, is thus seen as the leader. A leader is one who, who knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way. Now is your time. Noblesse oblige. Privilege entails responsibility. You are seen as the privileged person because you have got a tertiary degree. You are professional. The people look up to you, follow the rules and lead the way. And therefore I would like to thank you. And this, Casey, as I said, you are surrounded in this picture by people that are not uh, selfish, they unselfish, working for the dental community to the best of our abilities. We did what needed to be done and we did it in 11 days. Thank you. And I would again say, Viva South Africa. I thank you. 
Thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Swart. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. I know you have summarized a lot, but we obviously have uh, already given the protocol to the members. Just to let you know, as members and those that are watching us via Zoom and or Facebook, uh, the protocol, the final document is going to be it's going to be distributed very soon. I had intended to do it this weekend. However, I think I want to allow people to the wrote, everything documented. I have also um, videos okay. uh, from uh, sounding from the probing. Dr. Uh, Howard, can you uh, mute your mic? I would say also. Dr. Lackman, please mute I your mic. Uh, I'll I'll let you say something in a few moment. Uh, can you hear? So, me? Dr. Dlackman? Yes, I'm here. Please, can you switch off your mic? Um, so, so going forward, we will release that. But if you read that document and you've got questions, comments that maybe we need to take care of before we finalize the document, please, can you email us? I will, I will, I will send that information through to uh, the, the, the committee that you're looking at now, and they will work on it before we actually produce the very final document. A few things that I wanted to only introduce now is that this particular webinar has got uh, a CEU one for tonight um, as minimum. For those of you that have joined us via the Zoom itself, the over 340 people that have joined via Zoom, you will um, you will get your, 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 your CPD certificate once it's sorted out. For those of you that have joined us, I, I see about 160 uh, Facebook, you must go to our website. You will find a questionnaire that is linked to this particular webinar. You must answer those questions on the webinar, and then you will also get the certificate. It doesn't matter whether you're a member of the South African Dental Association or not. You will be able to um, uh, uh, do that uh, particular test. Also, I wanna emphasize our meetings are open to any oral health practitioner. It doesn't matter whether you're a member of the South African Dental Association or not. The other thing that I would like to do now um, is that I'm gonna ask Dr. Swart, we should have done this at the beginning, if you can introduce your core group that we have here and whoever it did not come here, then I'm going to take questions. If you have questions, I see there's eight questions so far on a Q&A, which is surprising for me. Um, we thought we we're gonna get zillions of them coming through. So maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> um, if you have questions, please look those at, in Zoom, look at the Q and A button and you can type it there. And I'm gonna read the questions after Dr. Swart has introduced the panel. If you are on Facebook, you type it on the, on, on the timeline and we are going to read those questions as well. Dr. Swart, do you wanna quickly introduce the team? Um, my uh, my team, uh, my co-chair, Piet, uh, needs no introduction. Uh, Professor Piet van der Fever. Um, as I said before, Piet and myself spoke more than me and my wife. And my wife agrees with it every time. And she's repeated this story now very much. Piet has been a pillar to, to lean on uh, always because of his academic background. Um, it was, and it's always very nice if we could banter ideas around and uh, Professor Piet van der Feyfer, uh, my co-chair. Uh, then Dr. Mark Bowles, uh, in private practice in uh, Cape Town, always willing to help. These group, this whole group, I, it's very difficult to uh, um, uh, uh, mention anybody uh, as a single, because we're a group, we worked closely as a group. Mark helped a lot in, in looking at all of the problems. He's, uh, he did a lot on the uh, high HVEs. And then Dr. Jean Westhuizen. Jean has just finished a book uh, on <coughs> the hygiene practices in oral health care. Um, and we were lucky to glean some of that information into our document. And then Dr. Stephen Suanapul, 
uh, a general practitioner who, have I, who I've just met uh, digitally and not in person yet. He is in private practice uh, with uh, some colleagues and they, he was very helpful in helping us, keeping our feet on the ground and giving us the right diplomatic way uh, how to go through and to solve a lot of difficult problems. That is the panel uh, that worked in the core group. Dr. Howard Gluckman, I see, but he's not alive on it. Um, he was very instrumental in writing the protocols on uh, the specialization of lasers and the four-handed dentistry. Uh, thank you very much and always a pillar to lean on. And, and Dr. Marishani, I know she's not here, if you can Dr. just Mar acknowledge. Dr. Marishani, uh, I thought I must just in introduce those that's here tonight. She could unfortunately not join us tonight. Um, she was very, very involved from the beginning. Um, as I said, one morning at three o'clock, she was sent me all the definitions of the aerosol generation and still we were bantering and getting it right to the final word. So Shloki, for that, I thank you. And as I said last night, when you said you couldn't sit here tonight, I said, that is, you would have been one of the big hands that I would have liked to hold tonight next to me. Um, and unfortunately she could not make it. Thank you very much. Um, is there anyone from the panel that want to say anything before we go to the questions? Any additional information you want to pass? Alternatively, I'm going to go to the questions. No. Okay. Let's go to the questions then. I see they're coming fast and furious now. I will just say the question. I'll read the question and any of you can uh, elect to answer. The question number one. Are dentists and hygienists allowed to do any procedures during lockdown level one to five? Can the medical aid scheme deny paying for certain procedures during this lockdown by Dr. Anonymous? You wanna take that? And just ensure that your mic um, is now um, unmuted. Panelists, anyone down wanna take that question, Prof? Let's go. Yes, I think um, the first question is, are dentists and hygienists allowed to do any procedures? Um, they are allowed to do mostly in level five emergency treatment, and then it becomes easier. I think I suggest that Anonymous reads the document on all the levels, and then it will be outlined properly. Um, the second part of his question is, can medical aids deny paying for certain procedures? They surely did uh, uh, deny paying for cosmetic or for general procedures in level five. We are trying to get our documents to them that they can see what is outlined in level four, level three, and hopefully they won't deny payment for those procedures. Um, the following question, thank you, Prof. The following question I don't think is uh, for you guys. I will take this question. It will form part of our Q&A. We have dealt with this question to Dr. Anonymous again. Uh, we have dealt with this question. In terms of paying staff, can we not pay staff if they have not worked? Is there grounds to make staff redundant because of lockdown? This is a question that was for yesterday, and we have answered it, but we're doing a Q&A that we're going to publish, and this question will be there. Uh, this team is more on the protocols. Thank you so much. The next question um, from Dr. Bortman. Bortman, it seems the real effect of the pandemic will only hit us later when we will in the lower when we when we will in lower levels of lockdown wider scope of work i think you're just making a comment uh, we appreciate and we know that and dr um Diveji, if a difficult patient refuses to follow protocol like temp temperature check and give proper history can we refuse treatment panels Yes, definitely. I, I, I do think so. Um, if a patient, uh, he is not only endangering himself, he is endangering you, your staff, and all the personnel. Uh, a single person like that, uh, if, if 
an AGP procedure is done on him can infect a whole building. So definitely, yes, he must not be able to enter the, uh, the door into your practice. Thank you. The next question, Dr. Anonymous, if we are short of N95 masks, can we use a three-ply mask over it and continue to reuse the N95 mask? Can the N95 mask be rotated, that is one per day of the week, leaving it to self-sterilize for a week before reusing it? Wanna take that? Yes, um, that, that question has come up uh, quite a few times. It depends on the oral health care worker because you have oral health care workers that the distance from the patient during AGP procedures. So we must first define, was it an AGP procedure or was it a non-AGP procedure? If it was an AGP procedure, then the, unfortunately, the answer is no, it cannot be reused. If it was a non-AGP procedure, there are different protocols and John, uh, Dr. Oersteisen can elaborate more on that. Uh, in my own practice, if I did a non-AGP procedure, I use it once per patient and then send it for gas sterilization where I know it that according to the manufacturer's uh, labeling that it will not be damaged. I get a sterile uh, a mask back, which I can reuse in a non aerosol generating procedure. That is the way that I see it. Maybe John so wants to elaborate more. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Wasaysen? Thank you, Dr. Swart. Uh, thank you, Casey. Um, the question about reusing of, 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 of respirators come up very frequently. And um, a key thing that must be lifted out here that is recommended and should be adhered to is that reuse should be maximized at five, five times reuse. So no more than five times reuse. The suggestion of letting it fresh out for a week in a safe and, and non-contaminated place is, is also part of the recommendation as long as, as the chain of asepsis is followed and it's taken care of that there's no other contamination. Thank you very much. Dr. Pesca. Um, allows aerosols through and, and in that way um, allows the cleansing of, of the respirator. Thank Casey, you very much. May, may I uh, just the last comment? If you use an N95 mask in an aerosol procedure and some of that virus comes into the mask and you reuse that, you actually form the perfect incubator to, for that virus to uh, duplicate and replicate itself. Thus, you are increasing your viral load yourself. In other words, the highest amount of healthcare workers that were killed worldwide was because of rebreathing of the H95 contaminated masks. Thank you very much. Um, I think Dr. Pestana, your question has been catered for. If one uses a face shield, can N95 mask be reused? Uh, I think that we might have dealt with that. And Dr. Desai, uh, your question as well, I think it has been covered. Will wearing a three-ply medical mask over the N95 mask help in any way with prolonging the use of N95 mask during um, AGPs? That has been dealt with. The question from Dr. Whitting, is there any reason why UV is not mentioned as an effective measure to sanitize air? Anna? Anyone? I'll take that one. I don't know a lot about it, but I think one of the things that you'll find in the document is that we didn't cover a lot. And I see there's quite a few questions later on about UV lights and foggers and alternative methods to sterilize uh, your equipment and the air. The reason why we didn't address this and we left it open, you'll see in one section, we said 
uh, we recommend some of these things, but we didn't discuss it in detail, is because there's not good scientific evidence for it in the COVID articles at this stage in 2020. The last few scientific articles, they don't cover these topics very well. For instance, fogging, we looked extensively. There's a lot on fogging in hospitals, but not in dental practices. So that's why we didn't discuss it in detail because we couldn't base our judgment on evidence. No one says you can't use it. I think it's an adjunct in your practice, but we don't have enough scientific evidence to prove all these different things. I'll also, while I'm talking, I'll touch on the UV light uh, that someone has asked about further on. The UV light is good to sterilize equipment work uh, between procedures. There's no dwell time, but we have to be very careful because it can cause cataracts and it can also cause skin cancer. The new light that's under speculation at this stage is the far UVC light that is much more uh, human friendly. And I think in future, we're going to read a lot about that uh, for disinfection in our practices. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, the next question is, what code do we use to build third party funders for PPE? Uh, I'm not so sure if Dr. Swanepoel, it looks like it's frozen. Do you wanna deal with this question, Dr. Swanepoel? Kaishi, thank you. At this stage, there's no specific code. The, your codes that you can use is the 8110 and the 8019. And uh, we are looking and we are going to talk to the medical aides on uh, tomorrow and on Monday to see and, uh, uh, that we can use that the material factor uh, uh, of, of, of our codes. Does that answer your question? Thank you so much, Dr. Sonipu. Um, the question that earlier on, since it was not complete, so it, it has been returned, it seems that the real effect of the pandemic will only hit us later. When, we, when will we be, when we'll be in a lower levels of lockdown? Wider scope of work. The proposed work done in the different levels doesn't make sense. Um, anyone that wanna maybe deal with that comment? Uh, Dr. Bowers, I think uh, just unmute yourself, Dr. Yeah, Bowers, there we go. That's fine. Um, yeah, we, we touched a little bit on, on this and we will be guided by the levels. I think that we have to assume that if uh, uh, the number of infections starts to increase dramatically, we're definitely not going to stay at level three. We're most likely going to go back to level four or level five. So, you know, I think the, 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 the reflection of where we are in terms of infections in the country will depend on the, the level of dentistry that we will be allowed to practice. So we can't assume that we're going to go naturally from five, four, three, two, one. Um, you know, that will depend on a, a lot of the epidemiology and, the, and the, the transfer of the virus. So, and I think we will be in line with that as it develops. Thank you very much, Dr. Bowers. Dr. Yvette Solomon says, thank you for all the work done with protocol and guidelines for the profession. In terms of recommendations made, is there any possibility that recommendations could be made around best options for high volume evacuation equipment or extra oral devices and where to source them from, from in South Africa? Mark, so the question, know. yeah, you wanna take it? Anyone? I don't mind, I don't mind about extra oral. We're talking not about high volume suction now, we're talking about an additional extra oral suction again there's very, very little research at the moment to show um, exactly the benefits of having a, an extra oral. But of course, any extra additional uh, evacuation of, of aerosol is going to be beneficial. Um, and so, you know, we have to remind ourselves all the time about getting the basics right. So again, it's, you know, going back to what we've covered tonight, rubber dam, high volume suction at source. And you know, if we use those together, we're removing up to 98% of aerosol. So you know, if that is being applied, I don't really see the, the huge benefits in outlaying um, you know, for an expensive uh, additional um, suction system um, for the 2%, especially if we're using the right PPE masks and we're um, screening all our patients. So, um, again, the, the, the evidence is, is not there to show exactly what benefits 
we're going to get from these expensive uh, additional. We have to mention that they're additional. They're not in in in, in re going to replace the the existing suction system. So I think that's really important. Thank, Thank you very you, much. If I can just uh, uh, com uh, go on with that, I think it's important to understand that what we've put together is a guideline of of the of the of the, of the, the the minimum that you can do. And whatever you do after that really just comes down com comes down to um, your uh, just comes down to your um, sorry my my battery's just gone dead. It just comes down to your um, your you know selling your practice and using it as a marketing tool and things like that. Nothing really more than that at this point in time until such time as we get more evidence to to show that it's actually more effective than anything else. So I think just. We just have to stick to the science at this point in time. But Thank it you very much. Thank you. Um, there's a question from, I will assume it's Dr. Chetty. And uh, she, or the Dr. Chetty says, what is AGP? AGP is aerosol generating procedures. I hope this is a doctor, but that is the information. Thank you very much. The next one is Dr. Uh, Therian. He says, thank you for everyone for everyone's hard work and for SADA. Thank you very much for that comment. This team, as uh, Dr. Uh, Swart has indicated, has worked tirelessly. As he indicated, this normally takes about 18 months to, uh, to, to develop, but they took 11 days. And I've seen the work that they've done because they've been working throughout the night, finalizing chapter by chapter, nearly every four hours. So it's been a great work and we thank you for recognizing that and for recognizing the people that you see today and those that are not here. We thank you for that. Dr. Omar, is this not a perfect time for SADA to promote balanced billing to HPCSA? I've got an answer for this, but I'll allow Dr. Sonipul to uh, respond to that. Thank you, Casey. Uh, as far as my knowledge goes, the HPCSA does allow for uh, balanced billing. There is a lot of medical aids that does uh, uh, allow for balance billing as well. Uh, they don't allow balance billing for, for providers that's got contracts with them. The only medical aid that doesn't want uh, balance billing at this stage is discovery. If you charge one cent less or one cent more for a procedure, they pay the patient and not you. And that is something that we're going to address with them in, in the coming uh, days. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Dolath, please give some clarity as to when and how we will receive this protocol document and stroke draft. Um, Dr. Dolath, the protocol draft has already been released um, last week, or this, sorry, on Monday. Um, if you have not received it, you probably are not on our uh, database for distribution, but you can go onto our website and you can uh, currently download that document. The place where we have put the uh, protocol is a place where it does not require you to log in, so you don't have to be a member of SADA to download this document. The final document, a design document, will come in the next uh, week or so, once we've received all the feedback and we have made the changes that we wish with the team. Thank you so much. The next question is, the medical aids uh, schemes, I would suggest, are not paying us for the use of rubber dam, only with endo. How do we go about, about it? Patients also don't want to pay, and then we lose more work in an already strained practice. Med shield, bonitas, and gems. I think this, um, if you allow me, Dr. Sonipul and the team, um, it is the same, in the same line of PPE. This is one thing that we are going to raise. If you have attended the lecture on Monday with Prof, you, you will see, and what was presented today, you will see that rubber dam actually helps a lot when it comes to the hygiene perspective. So we definitely are going to ask the medical aid schemes that we are meeting in the next three, uh, three to four weeks, uh, four days, uh, to include uh, uh, benefits for that particular uh, procedure. The question, the following question, um, I would say this has been has been asked, but maybe uh, the team might want to comment. As N95 masks masks are scared. As case, is reuse acceptable if a double masking with a standard surgical with a standard surgical mask slightly different to what we have been they've, they've asked before? So, is as as N95 mask as case, 
is reuse acceptable if double masking with a standard surgical mask? Do you want to comment on this one? No. It, our, our answer, we've really looked at the minimal standards available. And if you have an infection from a patient, it can be one that is asymptomatic or in the first couple of days of having COVID-19 and not testing positive yet um, and definitely not having clinical symptoms, but the air is still a virus la uh, laden um, and you wear, you can put 10 masks over it. Uh, and some of that virus comes inside that N95 mask. You are starting to build up a coffin for yourself. Thank you. Um, availability of PPE is very, uh, is, is a very big concern from Dr. Fester. What do you suggest we do, and do you foresee that the situation will change soon? Um, indeed, we've had a problem with the PPE, but it would seem that this problem is easing. When I spoke to the chairperson of the uh, Dental Traders Association, she has indicated many of the traders are receiving this. Uh, I spoke to PPS yesterday, um, whom we spoke about yesterday as well. I know that their uh, PPE has arrived, a whole lot of PPE has arrived, and they will be communicating to, 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 the, to the dental fraternity. So yes, it would seem that it's going to get better in terms of the supply of PPE. Of course, it's critical that when you buy PPE, buy from a reputable um, organization so that you do not put yourself and your staff and even the patient at danger. The question from uh, Dr. Rob, um, some medical aid scheme refused to pay us for code 8101 since lockdown started, saying we must motivate why we are consulting. Dr. Sonepo, do you want to deal with this? Casey, uh, yes. Uh, this is also something that we're going to address with the uh, medical aids uh, and uh, see if we can get them to uh, the ones that they did not pay, that they pay for it. Because if you saw someone and you did a proper examination, you definitely are allowed to charge a 8101. Uh, and we are also going to address this. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Yasmin. The, doc the document says testing for COVID-19 for all staff every two weeks. Uh, PCR or antibody tests. I'm not sure if you're asking that question. And the cost implication for this, is it for their practice? I know this question was asked, but is anyone wanna try and deal with the question? And I will add some comments on it. We discussed it last night and we still do not ourselves have an answer to that, uh, Casey. Okay. This is one of the questions that will come on our Q&A uh, very soon, and we will be able to give you some answers. So we're going to uh, keep it in abeyance for now. Dr. Anonymous, apparently there is a very little chance of getting virus via the aerosol because the aerosol particle size is so small relative to the size of the virus. I refer to the presentation by Trozet's brothers and uh, Frederico Brana. I'm not too sure if you guys are aware of this, but do you want to deal with the question of um, aerosols um, particles being small? So it says, apparently, there is a very little chance of getting a virus via the aerosol because the aerosol particle size is so small relative to the size of the virus. I'll deal with it, what I know. Um, no, I think it's a very good it's, it's a very good diagram that was presented by Trolls and Brothers. Um, I think it actually focuses our attention that our risk of aerosols are probably lower than what we think. Because if we look at a droplet, there's a high virus load in it. If we look at aerosols, uh, from what they what they've shown, the size of the of the, the particles, uh, our, our our viral load in the aerosol. Now we've missed the question very early on um, that uh, was asked by uh, by someone I can't remember who it was now uh, to ask: Is there any evidence that dental aerosol can infect uh, a patient? Now there's no no scientific evidence for that, but there's two or three very good articles that suggest that 
looking at other viruses, that it is very, very possible. But there's no conclusive evidence to show it at that stage. I think the key thing that this, uh, this diagram from Trolls and Brothers show is the fact that hopefully our load, our risk is reduced, but not eliminated. So I think with good PPE and uh, with things that we protect ourselves, we can probably eliminate being infected. That's what it means. It doesn't mean that because the risk is low, we can just have a surgical mask and carry on. I think that's what you should take, take out of that message until we have more conclusive evidence. Thank you. Um, from Dr. Solomon, in terms of the PPS PPE incentive, and depending on the cost of the HVEs, could a recommendation be made that as practitioners involved with AGPs, we are provisioned with this rather than other PPE? It is just a thought and a suggestion. Thank you, Dr. Solomon. We're going to take this forward. Next question. I just saw an emergency case of Anouk today. Next visit, I'm supposed to do a scale and polish. Any advice since that now most high risk procedure? I think I think uh, we were we were pretty clear in the protocols for scaling and polishing and for hygiene work at level four. Um, 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 <clears throat> you can only use hand scalers, so scale and polish can be done. And certainly, from a from a perio point of view, one can do a full perio. And we actually recommend that you that you recall your perio patients and make sure that the perio patients are under control because of the systemic illness that's associated with periodontal disease. Um, but just make sure that at level four, you don't, you, you don't create uh, any spray because your ultrasonics are the worst of any of the instrumentation that we use. Um, at level three, you can use uh, ultrasonics again, but then again, your, the PPEs are critical. You want to reduce your, uh, your, uh, your water. Most of, the, most of the, uh, the, the units that we have have got, uh, you, can, you can reduce water flow. So keep your water to a minimum, but make sure that you're not overheating. So, you know, you can also just grab the tip and feel it and make sure that it's actually, or put the tip against your finger to make sure it's not overheating to, to, to make sure you haven't turned the water too low. So reduce your water flow. Um, if you're going to use it in level three, make sure you're working with uh, the maximum amount of PPEs. As Piet says, uh, err on the side of caution. Don't, uh, don't, uh, you know, don't, uh, don't, uh, we don't have enough information to be flippant with, with the procedures. And uh, other than that, you can go ahead and you can do your scale and polishes uh, at, at, from level four and level three, just at level four, no ultrasonics. Thank you very much, Dr. Dlakman. Uh, this com is a comment which relates to the question we've dealt with um, in terms of the aerosol size. I've dealt with that one. The second question, I think this has already been asked um, and it has been answered by Dr. Sonipul with regards to the progress on charge of the PPE. We are meeting with the medical aid scheme from tomorrow. So hopefully we'll get a closure soon. Um, Dr. Ru, Liru, not a question. Would just like to send greetings and thanks to my childhood friend, Lawrence Blackie uh, Swart from Etienne Liru. You get a, a high five there, Doc. <laughs> um, uh, Dr. Diveji, above what temp should we not treat? Above what temperature should we not treat? I think that's a question. Uh, I think it's uh, talking about the patient's temperature. That's correct. If there's any uh, indication that it is a uh, COVID case, then uh, it should not if there's any additional questions, uh, because the temperature that we look at is 38 degrees, um, but somebody coming in with 37.6, but he's got a sore throat uh, combined with a, a chest pain or so, it is, uh, if you follow the standard uh, uh, precautions and uh, list that we put out in the beginning, and um, if any of those questions are no, you should not treat that patient. Uh, or you should treat him with the caution that a positive patient needs. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Swar. Um, we've just lost the question. Just hold on. Just move I've down. Lost, 
down. Okay, I'll, now I've lost one question here. Um, let me go to this one. Uh, it says, interesting point of view. There is before COVID and now. The virus is here to stay. There is no after COVID. Does the panel agree? <laughs> it's a philosophical question, but if you want to make a comment, anyone? I will answer for um, the, I will answer. Okay, sorry, go, go ahead. I, I, well, I don't mind making a quick comment. And, and I think, you know, what we have to remind ourselves is that actually in, in dentistry, you know, we, we should, and all of us have strict uh, infection control, control procedures already in our practices that, that should t take care of a lot of the, the issues, you know, that are in front of us as well. So, um, yeah, I, I think we've had to tighten up the things that we really should have been doing or should be doing and so and add on a few extra layers. But I, I think that uh, a lot of what we're doing now will, will stay obviously for, for years ahead. I can't see things changing. Um, yeah. I think uh, just to add to that is that, you know, you must understand that the, at some stage we will reach herd immunity. And the other thing is, is that another phase will come when the vaccines start to become uh, available. So once we start getting that, then, then we will start getting to back to some semblance of normality. So I, I do believe that there is a post-COVID. I don't believe that COVID is here to stay. It's certainly going to be here for a long time or until such time we achieve those. But um, I think uh, what we need to do is we need to be prepared for the next one because another one's coming after COVID. There, you know, I mean, we, so we have to maintain our protocols and keep and, and keep going. Thank you very much. Um, the next question says, I would like to know about what was decided about how long must the room rest between treatments? Also about fogging the room after treatment and then the use of UV light to disinfect the room after AGP and any studies we can look at. Uh, I believe the last two parts have been addressed by both uh, Prof and Dr. Swart, but the question maybe that we have not dealt with is the issue of the uh, room rest. Do you, do you want to deal with this? Yes. Uh, sorry, there's also, there's, sorry, there's another further down. Also would just like to know the water used in erbium lasers. It's not for cooling and this can't be made as little as possible when cutting heart tissue. Just some of clarification on this. Uh, the next question would be for Dr. Gluckman, but I would gladly ask the first about aeration. Uh, the, the ventilation of your room is totally dependent on your own environment. And there's unfortunately no golden rule that can apply. Um, if you are unsure about it, then you must get uh, appropriate professional advice. But your air in the room should circulate between six and 12 uh, times uh, um, every hour. It must be completely recirculated, of more 12 than six. And the studies have shown that if in a sterile room, a person walks in with COVID positive and he, and he coughs in that room, before that room in a well-ventilated area is totally replaced and it's safe for another patient to walk into the office is 15 minutes. So that does not account for places where aerosol generation procedures are done. That is only in a waiting area. So therefore, the minute, the 15 minute rule only applies to a sterile room area. Thank you very much. Dr. Luckman, the other part? Um, what, we, what we mentioned in the thing, and this was in consultation with Peter Dubell and the, uh, the laser group, um, they helped us uh, with the protocols and thanks to them for doing that with us. Um, but certainly when doing teeth 100%, we want to make sure that we use as much water as necessary, but you can also turn the water down to some degree. So all we're saying is that stay within safe levels so that you're not going to uh, deep fry the pulp um, and damage the tooth in any way but by the same token, uh, try and reduce as much as possible within the guidelines set out by the protocols that, that, that are developed. And again, the correct PPEs, the correct HVEs, et cetera, are essential for using laser, whether you're using dry laser or wet laser, 
we have to understand that plume occurs with both dry and wet laser as well as the aerosol. So just be aware of that so that you can take the right precautions. At this stage, I'm going to ask those that are attending to please, unless, unless if it's a hot question to uh, allow us to complete today, not to send more questions. You can send more questions, but I may not be, we may not be able to answer them now. We'll do a Q and A, uh, but at this moment, 48 questions. I'm left with uh, uh, 18 questions. If you can please allow us to complete these questions. Uh, from Dr. Yeah, carry on, Prof. Uh, can I comment on the previous question? There was, a, there was a part there that we didn't address that I think is very important. Where someone asked, what is the time that you have to leave after fogging? Now, I just want to highlight a few points here that fogging is becoming very popular from the company's point of view, what products they sell. So there's three products we can fog with. The first one is hydrogen peroxide. And that if we use a concentration of 12%, we have to have a dwell time of about an hour to two, actually two hours. If we use a lower concentration like 6%, we'll have a dwell time of an hour and you can reduce that maybe to a, a dwell time of 30 minutes, just to take that into account. The other product that's very popular at this stage is quaternary ammonia. Uh, lots of companies are advocating dentists to fuck with this chemical. And according to, to, to the resources, if you fog with that in your practice, you should have full PPE on. Actually, the operator should have a gas mask on. And then you have to wait 20 to 30 minutes afterwards. You can't just fog between patients with quaternary ammonia. And then the third product is hypochlorous acid that is quite safe, that's got no dwell time, uh, but it's a wet fog most of the time. Uh, I think it's important that dentists have to realize not to just go and buy a fogging device and think they can do it between patients uh, without taking these into consideration. Thank you, Prof. Um, maybe at this stage, I see there's quite a lot of questions with regard to PPE and masks and everything. On our SADA website, there is a, a list of uh, suppliers that we have loaded there. Uh, Dr. Bierkas did a brilliant job in the first instance, and we keep on updating that. So maybe sometimes if you're not getting the supplies that you require from, your, uh, uh, lo from the place where you normally get from, please look at that list. Uh, it's been vetted by the Traders Association. Um, so please have a look at that and maybe you can get what you're looking for. Question that follows, Please inform us where we can refer COVID positive patients. I'm very concerned as my practice is situated in a shopping mall. And even if I wanted to invest in, a, uh, in becoming an AAR surgery, I cannot. Surely the Tiger Bank Oral Health Center in the Western Cape cannot handle all the COVID positive cases. When the numbers start to rise as expected in the winter months. Anyone? particularly those guys in the Western Cape? In, in, uh, in, in my situation, um, it is dealt with uh, privately and publicly uh, in all of the hospitals. We try to um, have a section of the hospital isolated from the rest so that uh, elective work can um, uh, start. So in, in all of the facilities in, in the public sector as well, um, they have an isolation area. So uh, it is not a specific area. Um, and if you would like to start doing an IIIR uh, room, it is a very good idea. And you can treat your positive patients there because that lessens the burden on the general um, health care. It's a very good idea to do. Thank you. We have so many root canal treatments that are supposed to be obturated when we when I think when can we start obturating? Patients are asking and we cannot provide answer as to when. Can I answer? Yeah, go ahead. I think if you look at level four where we currently are, the recommendation is that you do single visit in those and not bring a patient back to obturate. But however, Blackie explained the 80 20 rule. If you, if you think that patient can get reinfected again, or maybe a case that already is being reinfected, and you think that obturation is the best way to solve that patient's problem, you can obturate in level four. Just be careful. The same with checkups that we've discussed before. 
although you can do a checkup in level four, it doesn't mean that you can now recall all your patients that needs obturation or checkups and bring them in. You have to, have to still be cautious about that. But when it's in the favor of the patient and it can help the patient in the 80-20 rule, you can definitely do an obturation. And I think we will put that towards the medical aids as well. But obviously your practice will be monitored. You can't just suddenly do checkups, suddenly just obturate every root canal. It has to be done for the interest of the patient. Thank you so much. There are practitioners in my area who are practicing as usual, offering cleanings to patients without providing proper PPE to their nurses or sharing the risks of these procedures with their patients. Do you have words of caution to these practitioners? Um, Prof. Moipulai? Your mic is, thank you. Thank you, Casey. No, I think every practitioner needs to realize um, the consequences of doing treatment outside of the levels uh, at this point, because of national um, regulations um, inform us on what we need to be doing at which level. So it would be really um, risky for practitioners to carry on as per usual without paying attention to what is allowed per the different levels. And obviously the, the, the risk is on the individual practitioner, not the profession per se. So practitioners who are, um, who are going ahead and doing um, um, elective procedures without following the requisite um, PPE protocols and IPC protocols, they're really um, exposing themselves to um, litigation. Thank you. I think we, we, have, we have to add to that as well that it's not just litigation, that it is a, it is a criminal offense now. If somebody gets infected because of something that you have not done, you are charged with, with uh, either uh, attempted murder, and if that person dies as a result, then it is murder. So I think we have to be very careful about how we manage these cases and you really have to be able to justify the treatment that you are choosing to do on the patient. And you have to then again re reiterate strongly the correct PPEs as, uh, as uh, Prof just said now, correct PPEs, correct HVEs, everything that you've got must be right. Thank and you I so much. Add on that the last, sorry, uh, Casey, but the last thing is that uh, because uh, of COVID uh, um, epidemiological tracking, uh, cell phone tracking is now allowed. So your practice can be identified as a node, especially if you uh, um, go on unabated or even take advantage of uh, practitioners next to you that is not uh, do, that are complying to the law. Thank you. From a legal, medical, and ethical perspective. Can and should a dentist refuse a COVID positive patient for dental treatment? What are you right as a dentist? Can someone refuse a COVID positive uh, treatment to a COVID posit uh, positive patient? That is a, that is a very difficult uh, question to ask. Um, I think if there is a facility that can safe, uh, treat that patient safer and better than you, then that person should be referred to uh, that specific person. We've also written it in the protocol that should somebody be available in your area that can do this procedure uh, safer, better, um, then what you can, it's, you should refer that patient rather, uh, especially a positive patient, to that practitioner. For instance, um, Piet can put on an, uh, a rubber dam in 45 seconds. So if somebody struggles for 30 minutes to get on a rubber dam and still doesn't do it effectively, it's much better for the patient and all our, our whole uh, uh, profession that it is seen by somebody that does it often and correct. Thank you very much. Um, I think part of this we dealt with, but there's some other parts we haven't. Where do fogas, UV light, aerosol sprays, peroxide humidifiers, 
where do they fit in the disinfection protocol? I think we've addressed it. Yeah, so I think so too. Okay, uh, from uh, Prof Gilman, has anyone calculated the cost of these COVID-19 anti-transmission precautions for an aerosol producing procedure, e.g. scaling? These precautions seem to be horrendously expensive and could significantly escalate the cost of practices, particularly during the lockdown, where turnover are likely to be much reduced and even more so in practice that charge strictly uh, medical aid rates. I've done mm -hmm. that uh, uh, exercise this week because I started uh, reworking this week. Most of our instru uh, instrument or clothing equipment that we wear, ha for instance, the hazmat suit, uh, you can reuse and re-sterilize. Uh, the only thing that you cannot do is the N95 in an AGP procedure. So there are also a lot of cost saving measures that we can and we must put it through to our patients. We must not charge them uh, for each and every case a um, disposable item that under the rules where we are now are reusable. Thank you. I've been unable to source hydrochloric acid from chemical plant and pharmaceutical distributors. Any suggestions from anyone? I'll answer that. Um, there's quite a few distributors that can uh, supply you of that. I'll mention two names. Uh, one is Genion, a company in Johannesburg, and also from Radical Waters. And there's quite a few other ones. The key thing is you must try and get a stable solution. Uh, obviously, you'll have to buy a little uh, generator, and then you can buy Catholite from, from the companies. But they can text me privately, and I can help them. Thank you. Firstly, and, and I must thank you for all your hard work. There has been a lot mentioned about extra cleaning methods, UV light and fogging. Is there any way of getting further detailed information on appropriate and correct use of this? The information seems to be very muddled with misinformation. Um, we, Prof, do you wanna deal with this? Yeah. I think we dealt with that. That's why we didn't address it in a document because we yeah. can't find proper evidence at this stage. Absolutely. How infected is the mask if it's used exclusively with the face shield on during every procedure. How infected is the mask if it's used exclusively with the face shield on on during every procedure? I feel we might have kind of touched on the reuse of the mask and the use with the shields at some stage. As, as to how infected, I don't think any of you, unless if maybe you've seen some evidence, you know. But I mean, we've dealt with how to use that together. I think okay. Study that I know. Yeah. I think the key question here is the person wants to know if the shield will protect the mask. I think it will protect it up to a point, but as Blackie said, when we do AGP procedures, there's a very high risk that there could be a breeding space for back for viruses on that mask. So we should actually replace it. Yeah. What is the opinion from uh, Dr. Desai? What is the opinion of the panel on the use of the medically adapted scuba mask? with HEPA filters for AGPs. Can I comment on that? Go ahead. I haven't used the exact scuba mask, but I've got full face masks in my practice. And what I find is that your vision is quite blurred through it. Uh, it's not ideal vision. So um, uh, I don't think it's, it's, it's recommended to work all the time with it, especially if you go posteriorly in the mouth. Um, at this stage, I've given up on my full face masks. Even some of my masks can fit looped inside, but the, the quality, the vision quality, your visual acuity is not great. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Bezerenhout, we have dealt with your question before with regards to the cost of the uh, testing for every two weeks. I'm going to go to Dr. Van Niekerk. In the SADA protocols, page 31, the different cleaning agent is listed with detail. One of the agent is hydrochloric acid. I cannot Google this name. It suggests Hypochlorous acid. Can we have more detail on this agent? The NH, the NAHCl, and alcohol kill my nose. <laughs> it's it's hypochlorous acid, and if they Google hypochlorous acid, they'll find the articles on it. That's what we discussed before. It's Thank a you. spelling mistake in our document. 
and we will correct that for the final document. Thank you for that question, uh, Dr. Fanica. Uh, Dr. Ferreira, would it be recommended not to reuse endo files or can we safely sterilize and reuse? Prof, one of possibly yours? I think if you, if you, uh, if there's big contention about this because that's why some countries don't recommend to, to reuse files, but that's mostly for prion disease. Uh, I think in general, the rest of the world is autoclaving their files after ultrasonic cleaning. And I think you're quite safe with, uh, with COVID disease, if, if that's what I refer to, because COVID, COVID the viruses are easy to kill with soap and water. So if we go through ultrasonic bath with chemicals in, the, the files are cleaned and then sterilized and autoclave, I don't think we have any problem with that. If we, if we start debating prime disease, then maybe we have a point there, but not, not regarding COVID. I think you can safely reuse your files if it's properly cleaned. Thank you so much. If one uses N95 or equivalent mask with an expiratory valve, should one use a surgical mask over to avoid the HCP from infecting the patient? The respiratory mask is actually uh, more protective than N95. Um, and no, it's not necessary. Thank you. I've been asked from Dr. Reddy, I've been asked the question of ozone use in anti-infective medium in COVID-19. During SARS virus, ozone was advocated in some countries. I think the question is, is this um, effective during this time? It if anyone what knows. Ozone, what ozone are you referring to? Um, I think ozone in, in air sterilizers are probably quite effective. There's quite a bit of evidence on it. If they're referring to ozone water for a disinfectant, I think the evidence is very poor on that, especially the South African generated uh, ozone technology that we've tested and we didn't find good results in it. So I think ozone will be my last call if I have to, to, to disinfect my practice. Um, I think a also, sorry, just to add on that, Piet, I think that and they have to be very careful that it's at the correct level because I think that mm. if ozone is slightly, it's, it's actually not effective at all. And once it gets to the higher level, it also becomes super expensive. Oh. So again, I, I think it's definitely not the go-to. Thank you so much. Dr. Osman just want me to remind members that the next um, feedback session will be coming from the coding and hygiene uh, work stream. So the issue of coding will be discussed in detail there. And it will be at uh, the same time as this one. So we, we invite you to join that uh, meeting led by Dr. Olifan Skalkveig, and you can get more answers in terms of the coding. Uh, Dr. Lala, thanks for the extraordinary work done by the panel. We appreciate your uh, acknowledgement to the team. Uh, Dr. Mayer, if a patient you have seen in the practice calls back three days later to say they have tested positive, what needs to happen in the practice and to the staff on site at the time. I think nothing, nothing should happen actually. Let me answer that and then Blackie can carry on. I think if we treat all patients as positive patients and your, your disinfection and your PPE control is, is adequate, then you should have no concern. If you were one of the dentists that's just carried on treating patients with no PPE, I think you should be very, very worried. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Erasmus, everybody can agree that the committee has done a great job. Biggest problem will be getting paid. Brings again the issue of balance billing, which will help both us and patients to afford cost of PPE. SADA should get that through to uh, schemes like Discovery. And again, uh, Dr. Sonipul, as head of the DPCOM, is taking note of that. Thank you, Dr. Erasmus. Dr. Lala, my question, in terms of surface disinfection, what are recommendations in terms of what products to use? Is there a recommendation? I see John is uh, not on at the moment. Uh, she, she, she has all the answers. She actually is. Uh, Dr. Westhazen, do you want to address this one? You know, uh, if I give you a typical academic answer, that will be difficult. Um, um, when it comes to products itself, I'm not the expert. The, the, the practitioners in the practices are the experts. Well, general, depending on what surface you're talking about. If you're talking about floors, the old-fashioned household bleach is going to do the thing. 
Um, on surfaces, I think you know your dealers better than I do, and you know what you order from them. The products that's been used and approved and tested by accredited uh, regulators is the safe ones to use. Continue using it. it, it it's things that we've been doing for, for forever that we've been dealing with in the industry as, as long as I can remember. So don't doubt your products. Your products are good. Thank you. Um, I think this is a comment. The lockdown was to reduce the load on hospitals. There is currently no load on hospitals. The virus will likely be with us for over another 18 months. Why must we suffer when we, as a rule, have the best disinfection and PPE in the country? Um, I don't know if you wanna, anyone wanna make a comment on this one? It's an opinion and a comment from a member. If there's no one that really want to add, yeah. I think at, at, uh, at level three, you pretty much can go back to um, not normal, but you can do pretty much everything. And, and the president has said that by the end of May, some places, the Western Cape, unfortunately, might not be one of those places because of our levels. Um, but we can go back to doing pretty much what we're doing with taking the right precautions. So I think um, with a bit of uh, hope and a bit of luck that by the end of this month, you'll be back to some semblance of normality within your practice, just looking like a spaceman. Thank you so much, Dr. Luckman. Uh, the following question, we really have dealt with this a few times, although there was not a month. Uh, we will get back to you on this issue. Uh, Dr. Pestana feels that this one has not been answered. Any comment on the use of face shields, especially to extend to extend the use of N95 masks to protect and to protect eyes. I don't think this question has been answered, he says. The, the, one <laughs> the face shield does protect it from spatter. And uh, uh, the, so the spatter, so there's not external contamination, but the aerosol, unfortunately, it, unless you have a totally se hermetically sealed unit around your head, the aerosol will come into contact with your uh, N95 mask. So yes, it will not have blood, spat, blood and saliva spatter on it because of the shield that you wear, which is a very good thing to have. So you should be wearing a, a face shield to protect yourself. Um, but the aerosol, unfortunately, is not stopped by um, the shield itself. Thank you, Doc. Um, if a patient has a temporary reading of 38 degrees, how would we proceed? The reading could be related to other temporary factors like exercise, etc. How do we proceed in this case? And one must also remember that there's a lot of normal viruses also around. So all of the uh, high temperatures cannot all be related to uh, COVID. But unfortunately, at this stage where we are, one then needs to be tested. If there is no direct, because of heat uh, exhaustion, uh, an environment that you come from, there's a lot of differences that can bring about that. But you must use your professional judgment to see if that uh, temperature that the patient has is in relation to a viral type of uh, infection. Thank you. Um, will Sada join NOMADS in helping to co-sponsor PPE for dentists in need of assistance? I will answer this question. This is a matter that is now sitting with the board. They will um, adjudicate and make the final decision. Is complete coveralls recommended during dental procedures, and what is the disinfection recommendation for these gowns? I think, Piet, your group that did very well. Uh, I think, I think, I think the recommended uh, for coveralls is probably if you have a COVID positive patient. There's nothing wrong to treat every patient like that if you can afford it, but for a COVID positive patient, I think that in a gen dental practice with I without the AAR. I think that will probably be the standard of, uh, of care that you, that you should follow. Uh, the second part of the question was, how would you disinfect it? Uh, yes. Depending on the type of material, um, if, it, if it is a plastic type of material, you can just disinfect it 
with any disinfectant in your practice or dip it in a low concentration of bleach solution. Um, there's also good studies like the N95 masks that you can uh, disinfect with hydrogen peroxide fogging. Uh, that's quite effective. There's quite a few articles on that and also for the cover -off. Thank you so much. I am awed by the amount of work that your team has done for the entire dental community in South Africa. I am saddened to see a lack of regard for all this information by several colleagues who are only interested in money uh, rather than what is right. This compromises the entire profession. I noted your, pers your persuasion for us to be professional and ethical. Sadly, I am seeing so much disregard, specialists and general dentists, and this is coming from Anonymous. We note your concern, and I think it relates to some of the issues that I get from the office um, on a daily basis, complaints about uh, people that take, uh, are disregarding everything else that is being recommended. What is the recommendation time between AGPs? Uh, after how long can the next patient come into the room because they obviously do not have a mask? Did we not touch on this earlier on? Uh, if not, can we, we, we did, we did. Um, and I think it's also very clear in our, in, in the protocol itself. Uh, doc, uh, Dr. Jumana asks, will the wearing of theater cloth caps and gowns and washing them daily be acceptable? As a, uh, as a practice wear, scrubs, yes, it is recommended. Thank you. Dr. Singh, with regards to patient screening, is it, is it a recommendation that we take patient temperature or is this mandatory? Also, are we required to keep this information on record? Anyone? We, we do that. Um, at the moment, it is very difficult to get hold of the external thermometers, um, and some of them are of inferior quality, not giving good readings. Um, and yes, it must be part of the record. Uh, the full questionnaire um, that the patient signed uh, coming into your practice must be part of the patient's record. Thank you. Second question, can dentists be sued legally held responsible by patient who was diagnosed with COVID and say that they obtained a virus at the dentist? I think short and sweet answer is yes, the patients have the right to actually sue you as a practitioner. You will, they will have to prove that they actually got it from you, but you also have to prove that you have taken all necessary precautions for you not to, to have the virus transmitted. So it's very critical and very important and these protocols are some of the way that you can protect yourself as a practitioner if you can indicate that you have followed everything. So it is critical that you do not um, fall on the wrong side of the law when it comes to this. I think uh, Dr. Bowers even indicated you can be charged for murder. Um, so this is quite serious. Anyone yes. want to add anything yes. there? Does it not? Yeah. Does it not also? In, uh, does it not also though need uh, the onus is on them to actually prove that you knew that you had COVID. So if you don't know you have COVID and you infect somebody, you cannot be held responsible. And I'm just, I'm sharing this from my wife who is an advocate, you know, this is a, yeah. you know, something that we've discussed in private. So um, I think that's also important. Yes, absolutely, absolutely agreed. Um, Anonymous, I'm not sure if the question was answered properly earlier. The Minister of Health said today, the time has now come to look forward to the horizon and take bold steps to beat the virus. The government has prepared a district-based approach to its COVID-19 response. Moving away from one-size-fits-all method, we are now aware that most provinces will move to level three in about two weeks. We also know for a fact that infection rates are rising by the day. Level three allows us to push the envelope a little in terms of what we can do. The question was, how are, we, uh, how are we allowed to do more when infection rates are higher and we were doing a lot less at level four and five when infection rates were lower? Please excuse my long-winded question. Anyone from the panel that wanna deal with this comment? Piet, do you want to take it? Otherwise I will. Uh, take it, I, I can't answer it properly. I think that, um, the readiness of the country uh, when COVID was uh, announced, we as a country, our medical healthcare were not uh, sufficiently geared 
to handle it. And it was time for the medical uh, um, group or the medical uh, um, fraternity to gear up to be able to handle the amount of COVID. If you think that in the first week, the accumulation was 42%. And uh, we are now working on an average accumulation of 5%. It is very clear that we were not ready at that stage. And if you think that is, if you think back of my slide, which I said, uh, where the arrow goes, um, did we preemptively or postemptively uh, treat uh, this problem from SADA? And you were the one that instigated it, uh, uh, Casey. Um, we have now got, um, and what I wanted to say was, we are now, if we look back at the period of time where we are now, we will most probably say it was the safest of times that we were working in. But because of this protocol document, and that is why we worked so endlessly, is we have now structures in place to make it safe to practice dentistry, even with a higher viral load. And if you do this and get it as a routine in your practice, the chances that you will get seriously ill or fatal, have a fatal injury due to COVID is very low because we are now prepared, especially as dentists and especially having this document at hand. Thank you so much, Dr. Swart. I think if I may add, at the beginning, we did not have information and information has come along. We still need more information. And what we have done with the information that we have, we have developed protocols to actually make it safer for the dentists to operate and therefore be safer and their patients and their staff to be safer. If, if we did more right at the beginning, it would have been disaster because we, had not, we didn't have these protocols to, to help us to protect ourselves and the patients and the staff. So I think that's basically what the issue is. Now we know and probably more information is going to come. Dr. Swart, this is for you. Explain how a virus can multiply in a mask outside a host cell. The, the problem is that uh, the biggest problem with N95 mask use is that it's inaccurately used. And inadvertently, uh, they, it is not fitted as well as it should. And there's a space uh, where the virus can enter. And invariably, a person touches his mask, an accident can happen. So if you can guarantee me that all the N95 masks are 100% sealed off, it would never get to the inside surface of the mask. And therefore, it would never uh, uh, be an area where it can uh, grow. But because we know there is problems, uh, we know that it can enter the, the N95 mask. Thank you. Um, at this stage, I want to say it is now um, 10 to 9. We're going to only carry on for the next 10 minutes. All the other questions, the, panels, the panel, will, we will take the questions and we will create a QA and a and then we can send it through um, or publish it. Uh, otherwise, we're going to carry on for much longer. Could the use of disposable plastic aprons over PPE coveralls surgical guns allow for reuse of PPE for NAGP, up to how many times can the PPE be reused? I feel that we have kind of covered this. Uh, there may be an angle that maybe we have not covered. If there is an angle, maybe you can deal with it now. I think we've covered that. Yeah, yeah. happy with that. The next question as well from, uh, uh, which says, how long can you use the N5? That has been covered very well by Dr. Wasaisen. The next question, how long must the room rest? This has been also answered. Um, can any of the panelists speak to the replacing of water in our ultrasonics and chair water lines with other chemical substances? It's a new question, this one. I'll take that. Um, Thank you. I think water lines is one of the areas that we have neglected in the past very much. And, and the, the quality of our water lines is something that we should all gear up. The quality of the water should be tested there should be a, a, a regular routine protocol to, to verify the quality, um, especially with the new chairs that is equipped with, with closed systems with a water bottle that, can, that you can fill with disinfectant 
um, some kind of disinfectant and, and that should be cleared with your um, equipment um, supplier. Uh, you should follow the instruction manual of, of your equipment. But very often um, sodium hypochlorite, the household jig is the old and trusted protocol when it comes to water safety. Uh, it's cheap, it is effective, uh, but that should be verified and checked. One thing that should be done after each patient procedure, all the water lines should be flushed for at least 20 to 30 seconds. At the end of the day, those lines should be flushed for a longer period to empty the lines and to get everything uh, that is contaminated the lines out of the lines. Um, and that is a, a, a protocol that is neglected. And I cannot stress the importance of a simple procedure like flushing your, your air and water lines to, to, to increase the safety. Thank you very much. Are we obligated to treat asymptomatic COVID positive patients who need emergency treatment? I think it's the same as any patient that walk into your practice. Um, I think if they're not symptomatic uh, or asymptomatic or symptomatic, you have to make that call. Um, I think if a patient has got symptoms, you must make the call if you can refer him to a, a better facility. But you can't show those patients away because the next patient that comes into your practice might be positive and they don't know it or they don't tell you. Absolutely. This question from Dr. Van Nierkerk is a duplicate, some for the second time. Great. And then and then for Dr. Swart or anyone else, surely because they are asymptomatic in if infective patients, all patients must be seen as transmitters of virus. And so we need to keep to the highest protocol regardless. I think you've just touched on it just now. So I think we all agree on this one. Um, should a regular air conditioner in our rooms be switched off to avoid viral spread? Good question. Um, the, the question, uh, it, it, that all depends on the connection uh, and where that air conditioning is going. So if the ducts uh, is linked to your neighbors, then um, it is best to switch it off, but you have to have uh, air circulation. And the best air circulation that you can have is to open your windows. So it's as simple as that. Um, but you have to replace the amount of air. And if you are in a very limited space with only an, a, a circular uh, air con um, that is in a line with um, your neighbors, as the pictures I showed at the end on my take home message, uh, there you've got to be very, very careful um, because you've got to have air changes in your room, but you must not infect your neighbors. Um, so for in cases like that, you must see, seek to it that you have an outside outlet. Thank you very much. Second, or, next. Or, or, oh, sorry, or obviously uh, the proper filters. Thank you. Lupus are a, a problem. Any ideas on how to use it correctly without being exposed? I'll take this one. I think this is a very good question. We are all seeking at this stage to find the ideal solution. What, what people have modified at this stage is to place a, a thin transparency material over the loops that they can protect themselves. But I think we are in need for a good designed uh, type of, of, of uh, goggle that will fit fit for microscopes and loops or a type of protective uh, uh, plastic. Um, the key thing that I think we should focus on as well is that if you wear loops, you are further away from the patient. So that might give you less exposure risk. And I think a key advantage here is a microscope. I've been measuring the distances that I'm working from a patient when I use my microscope. And it is probably about 30 to 40 centimeters away from the aerosol field. So I think microscopes at this stage is also something to consider, especially if you have rubber dam on to, to get your face out of the aerosol view that we are subjected to. But a very good question because we need solutions 
and there is no proper solutions at this stage on the market for loops. Thank you. Um, if you use N95, K N95 mask is left for a month in a brown bag, uh, the virus will die off, making it relatively safe to use. Do you agree? I think that's reuse. Studies have been uh, done citing that the virus lives for about nine days. So if there is a financial constraint or dire shortage of masks, it may be a viable option to do this? We cannot recommend it in aerosol generating procedures. In non-aerosol generating procedures or distant uh, people more than 25 centimeters away from the patient, yes, it's a very good practice and should be done. But if you are in close proximity with an aerosol procedure, Unfortunately, for, according to the science, no. Okay. Must, must we have 12 to 15 air changes per hour in our rooms with HEPA 13, 14 filters, a UV, etc.? cetera? This is a theater specification and unaffordable for our practices. Windows are a very good option. Open the windows. There we go. Thanks for the work of this team. The minimum recommendations are immediately achievable by only a few dental practices. What would SADA and DP, DP support be if dentists fall short of these uh, during the next three months? Uh, surely a thorough assessment and 90 page document cannot be implemented in 30 days. And I think this is a very uh, uh, important comment which we dealt with. Do you guys wanna uh, deal with the journey? I think I'll answer this and then Blackie can take over. I think. There's a lot of information in the document and I want to urge everyone that's listening tonight to read the document. We get comments from dentists that misinterpret the document tremendously because they scan through the document. So please read the document in detail. Coming back to the question, it doesn't take a lot. It takes a basic good disinfection protocol in your practice and wearing the correct PPE. And you can look at the diagram, what the level of PPE you want to be. I think. As Blackie stated before, it's between aspirational and between essential. That's where you will be probably the most safest dentist to protect yourself, your staff, uh, and also your patient. This is not a question. Sincere, sincere thanks to the Sada team for your support and guidance during this pandemic. A special hello to my former lecturer, Prof. Moipulai. Thank you for providing excellent lessons as a student. God bless you all. We appreciate. Are there any statistics that you may have on COVID infection rates amongst OHC, oral healthcare workers worldwide? Um, I don't know if anyone has got that immediately, but this is something that we can we can source for you. We will try and, okay, Doc, Doc what? Uh, there, there's uh, the new studies is out uh, um, uh, in comparison uh, with previous uh, viral uh, epidemics. And um, the, the amount of dentists that died is available, but there is no document to state if it was related to the occupation or not. Thank you. If we go the theater specification for air conditioning, do we need a positive pressure or a negative pressure system? I do, not, I do not know the exact difference, uh, what they say, but a negative pressure room is the ideal. Uh, and uh, that is the uh, gold standard, uh, if you can achieve that. And a positive pressure, if you are in a closed, enclosed uh, surgery, and you, with a positive pressure, it means it, it circulates the air and you can lay, have the windows open so that new air comes in and a change of air can happen. Then positive air pressure is a very good thing. I'm taking the last five questions. Should we be using a quaternary ammonia products as most dental companies sell us when these are allergenic and definitely bad for asthmatics? For older dentists, latex allergy was uncommon until latex gloves became commonplace in examination. The regular use of QAC products could have the same effect. Any opinions on this? I think we dealt with it in a way, but it's a good question. Again, I want to draw your attention. If you fuck with these products, uh, there's a higher chance of becoming allergic to it or for asthma patients, for instance, 
if you use it as a surface disinfection, uh, I don't think it's such a big problem. But if you start fogging, you have to be careful with that. And um, we'll have to think about that carefully if we do it at the level that we disinfect our practices at this stage. So I think it would be a good idea to alternate these solutions in your practice and not just use a QIC product, QIC product all the time. Thank I you. Add to that, yeah. uh, it. Um, that's why they've moved away from the solutions in spray bottles and rather use the wipes at this moment to get rid of the aerosols and use it, uh, the chemical uh, expose the surface to uh, through a wipe, a wet wipe. Dr. West Hazen said, may I suggest adding hypochlorous acid to our clean water system to reduce the viral load in the aerosols? It's a question. I appreciate all your input. Thanks. I'll take that one. Uh, I think the person with the most experience on this is Chris Marie that was involved with radical waters that developed 15 years ago uh, hypochlorous acid for this use. We've tested it extensively. Uh, we had webinars recently about it and Chris's comments was that it is corrosive if it's not at the right PPM level created. So you have to be careful with that. Long term, you can mess up your unit with it if it's not a very stable product. I think if anyone has questions on that, we contact Chris Murray because he's got the most knowledge on that. Okay, this is coming from a retired uh, Mexlofacial, Dr. Lori. He says, senior citizens, debilitated patients in care facilities where care is sometimes deficient. What is the advice that can be given and where should patients in, in this group attend? Uh, hello, Prof. Lurie, uh, nice to hear from you. Um, he was one of our mentors. Uh, Prof, there is not, the, unfortunately, um, the healthcare system for the COVID is the same as normal. There's the public and there's the private. Um, and unfortunately, there's isolation areas in the private and isolation areas in the um, uh, 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 public sector. Um, so uh, being of an elderly age and comorbidities, one is at a higher risk group and one would really try and avoid any places where there is a, a high risk area of getting the virus like in hospitals so therefore a lone standing private practice in a house with open windows is most probably your safest area to go thank you um from dr mccalvey uh, all the way from the uk uh, the representative of dental protection hi casey there are obviously a number of ethical issues if you collect them we can try and provide an answer or join a further panel with the team Absolutely, we will do that. Um, I think you, it will be good for you to join one of the panels and be able to expand on that. Someone asked about the use of half masks. Is it recommended? I don't I even know what a half mask is. I think referring, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I have no clue what a half mask is. Uh, we're not Sorry? Don't use Trump? the half mask, use a full mask. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know what half masks are, but um, I think I, I agree with you, Dr. Glattman, don't choose them. <laughs> I think that's, that's very scary. <laughs> um, you're gonna be infected halfway. <laughs> um, the last two questions. Um, since the virus cannot penetrate the skin, it is, is it okay if I just wear a Speedo, uh, N95 mask, goggles and a visor, gloves and take a shower between patients? As long as you wear a South African speedo, uh, like our rugby team did, most probably will. It is just you're going to have a lot of contaminated surfaces. Um, <laughs> yeah, share, uh, well, the, share the video. <laughs> share the video. I want to see the it. video online. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, please allow me. I'm going to be left with 20 questions and we will deal with them. I, I, I'm sure some of them are repetition, but from Dr. Mashiana. Please advise on patient scheduling in order to utilize slots optimally without compromising effective infection control procedures. Want to take that? I want to make a comment on this, but not answer the question. I want to come back because our group has discussed this issue, again, coming back to the checkups and bringing patients in for treatment. 
you have to realize that you have to allow proper time between patients for disinfection. So you you also have to, you will also have to see less patients in a day. There's no ways in this current level four situation that you can treat the same amount of patients that you did before uh, because of these reasons. So I'll leave that for you to think about and then someone else can comment further on the question. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll make a comment on that. I, th I think also it's not just about the time for uh, aerosol or, or, or air to move through. We have to also have time to clean surfaces and prepare and, and clear, clear the, the first patient. And then um, it's super important, obviously, to, to prepare for the next patient to get everything else. Otherwise, our, our uh, cross-infection control um, becomes uh, irrelevant if we're reaching for cupboards and pulling things out during the during during patients so uh, you know that's where a lot of the time gets taken is actually the preparation for each patient as well as the cleaning up of the previous and there's no way that in my practice uh it takes a minimum of 30 to 45 minutes that's what we're finding minimum you know we have the, we, we've had the same experience with starting this week and, and it really we've cut our patient number more than a half you know so what we what we used to see in a day we're seeing half and less than half, you know, so that we can create the time. And I think what you said, Mark, is so critical. You need to plan your day from the beginning and make sure that when you start your patient, you don't have to reach for your drawer. Everything that you need is out and ready because the minute you open the drawer, it gets contaminated. We are not dealing with HIV. We are not dealing with blood-borne illnesses anymore. We are dealing with an aerosol-borne illness and there's a, it's a whole different ball game. So we have to change our mindset and the way we think about our practice and think about what is out on the shelves, what are we leaving out, you know, and, and we need to give ourselves more time to clean all those areas. Thank you. And it's Thank you, now Get on. the whole staff to understand what they're doing and why they're doing it, maintaining their aseptic procedures from cleaning water line bottles uh, because often it's, it's our hands and what we do with our hands that contaminates further. Uh, and it's a team effort. We all need to sit down and strategize how we're going to do it and how we're going to do it effectively. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Orsazen. This is the last question. Uh, please appreciate if we have not read your question, we are going to uh, create a Q&A on all of the uh, questions coming from all of the streams and we are going to publish that. Um, I think we've done very well. We have so far answered 86 questions and I'm going to be left with just about 19 questions. And maybe this provide an answer to our earlier question. Is a half mask, e.g. the 3M Ebola mask and filter, so maybe that explains what a half mask is, better than an N95? How are they sterilized between cases and how long do those filters last? This will be my last question. Can I answer that? Yep. The, the half face mask, uh, we've realized now what it is, um, but it, it's actually a half, half mask referring to a respirator. Uh, the common one is from 3M and you can fit two filters on them. You can either fit, uh, fit the Ebola filter on them, that's a 6038, or uh, a lesser, lesser concentrated filter, the 5038. Uh, these filters are protected. So you can actually wipe them down or you can spray them. Um, the key advantage here is that you can wear these masks for quite a long period of time if there's no contaminants in the air. If you use them in a gas situation, for instance, they will probably be, have to be replaced uh, after about eight hours or nine hours use. The reported uh, time period on the internet is that surgeons in, uh, in Australia have been using these masks for up to a month of the filters, up to a month before they have to replace it because it's protected filters and you will feel when you when you wear the filter too long, you will start to battle to breathe. That's the time to actually replace it. Coming back to the second part of how to disinfect it, they recommend that you dip it in the entire mask can be either spray down between patients, or you can dip it into a low concentration of lukewarm water with sodium hypochlorite. And you can dip the entire mask and let it dry. So if that's your protocol, I would suggest you have two of these masks so that one can dry while you wear the other one or during the day. Thank you very much. I've actually just quickly scrolled down, look at the questions, and I see that majority of the questions are either a repetition or a clarification of some of the questions that we have dealt with. 
Um, I would like I, to I make one more comment. Yeah, please go ahead, Prof. I apologize. I just want to make one comment on these, these respirators. Everyone is in need of PPE and everyone is concerned about the cost. If you buy, for instance, a 3M4 mask, it costs you about 400 Rand and two filters will cost you probably 260 Rand. And then you can probably work a month or two months with that. Uh, and if you have a disinfection protocol for them, then you don't have to worry about your N95 mask. So I think it's a good option for dentists to start considering these respirators. And it's 10 times easier to breathe through them. So much easier. The most, most horrifying experience for me is to work two, three hours with an N95 mask. It's really crazy. And there's also CO2 buildup in that mask. So please look at these options because they are becoming affordable and they give you excellent protection. Thank you very much. Um, just in conclusion, I want to thank, thank the panelists um, and all the members that have attended. There is one more uh, uh, work stream on Monday on coding that is going to be holding a similar feedback session. There's CEU1 there. Um, what I do want to indicate that this recording, this webinar, is made available on our SADA website um, within about an hour after doing this, so you can, you can see it. If you are using Facebook, obviously it become posted immediately and you can also go and watch. For those who have, your colleagues who did not attend, they have the opportunity to uh, uh, go and watch this uh, webinar and answer the questions that are associated with this uh, webinar and then they will be able to be allocated a CPD certificate. Um, like I said, I believe the majority of the question, I've scrolled them, I scrolled down. There are other clarification or very similar uh, Dr. Lachman, I see you, are uh, very similar. So um, unless if anyone has seen something that stand out, um, we want to conclude this uh, meeting. But before we conclude, Dr. Lachman. Hey, see if I can just take a, a minute just to, I just have to give a, a huge thanks out to, to Blackie. Blackie was the one who started this and uh, I don't think we would be here without him. And I think a huge, huge, huge thank you, Blackie, for every bit that you've done and the the hours, I think more than anybody in this, certainly more than most of us in the group, Piet, you as well, Mark, or everybody. But uh, Blackie, a special thanks to you for everything that you did because you kind of, you opened the door, you kicked us all through the door and, and took us kicking and screaming through everything to get there. So for all the work and the effort, we wouldn't be here without you. And, and I think we have to just give a special shout out to you. A second thing that I have to say, Casey, is to you. In my 30 years of, of being part of the Dental Association, I never ever felt that the Dental Association represented me or did anything for me. It is the first time ever that I feel, and it's because of you, um, that the Dental Association represents my needs and the dental needs at heart. And I want to say thank you to you for everything that you do. You've been a true gentleman and really you've helped this profession in a way that we couldn't even describe. So just thank you to everybody and a special shout out. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Luckman, for that. And yeah, we, I mean, we cannot, we cannot stop to thank uh, particularly uh, Dr. Swart. I mean, I've worked with you and until now. I didn't know you existed, but, <laughs> but now I even know your routine. I know when I can call you and when I can't call you. <laughs> so, and I've taken advantage. I've been, I've been sending him WhatsApp and uh, I say, can I call you at 11 o'clock, at 12 o'clock midnight, one o'clock in the morning, say, can I phone you? And he will respond back and say, Casey, I'm available, I'm here, we can talk. And I wanna say thank you so much. This indeed would not have been possible if it were not for your uh, uh, leadership as coordinating this team. It's been a great journey. And um, I'm, I, again, as a person and as a CEO, I'm indebted to this group. I really am, uh, and to the other work streams. Uh, but I think the profession is indebted to what you guys have done and done it in a short space of time. I know that at time, particularly uh, uh, Dr. Swat, he's the one that uh, was getting some of the things from me when I said, I'm not happy with this. Can you please include this? Can we do it this way? And you would take that back to the team. And when I met with the team, explained myself, it, it, it's really been a pleasure, a real, real pleasure. And if it were not because the COVID is not something that we want to... Um, to have in our in our in, in our spaces, I would say, can we have another uh, challenge?
that we can actually put everyone together and work like this, but not COVID. <laughs> um, to everyone um, uh, attending from uh, Facebook, as well as attending from uh, the Zoom, thank you very much for attending. We will see you on Monday as we carry on with this journey. And thank you for the support and the words of encouragement to the team and for taking to heart what we have uh, indicated. The last thing that I want to indicate is that the protocol uh, is, given, is going to be given to the HPCSA. They are waiting for our, our document. You would have seen um, the protocol that came out around uh, two weeks ago or some guidelines from the HPCSA. They have indeed even recommended that everyone should try in the oral health space must follow uh, protocols like the, the one that we have created as the profession. The medical aid scheme, BHF, uh, CMS, all of those are waiting for this document. We just want to clean it up first and then we're gonna give it to them and hopefully they will get that next week. But I've been in communication with some of the CEOs of the medical aid scheme, the CEO of the HPCSA. I know that we will be able to submit this uh, for them. And I just wanna say, to everyone again, thank you and thank you and good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you.